Me, 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 Here we go. Hello, superstars. I got my Eddie shirt on today. So that means I'm doing a response for my good buddy, Eddie's Cardboard Chaos. Eddie wants to hear a human interest story, and I find this story very interesting. So I'm pretty excited about it, and I hope you enjoy hearing about Rollicking Raleigh Hemsley. I learned about Raleigh Hemsley from this book by Scott Longert called Bad Boys, Bad Times. It's about the Indians from 1937 to 1941. Hemsley was a catcher in the 30s and 40s, and in 1938, Indians general manager Cy Slapnica was looking to upgrade the team, and Bob Feller, who had done some barnstorming with Raleigh Hemsley, advised Slapnica to trade with the St. Louis Browns for Raleigh. Now, Raleigh was an all-star in 1935 and 1936. He was an excellent defensive catcher with a pretty good bat. And he was a really, really tough guy who wasn't afraid to get dirty and play through pain. But the Indians were his fifth team in the major leagues because he had problems with alcohol and it was getting worse every year. He would often show up to games drunk or hung over and he could be quite belligerent and he was known to even go AWOL for a few days at a time during the season. And he had lots of teammates that were heavy drinkers and that definitely didn't help matters. Since most games were day games, players had the nights off to party and he was always getting into lots of trouble. He had bar fights and car accidents and missed train rides. At one point, he estimated that he had racked up about $20,000 in fines, more than any other ball player of his era, but uh, that never stopped him from drinking. Uh, Slapnica believed his new manager, Oscar Witt, could get him in shape. And in 1938, Witt had suspended Raleigh twice, just six games into the new season, once in spring training. Uh, Slapnica offered Raleigh a nice bonus if he could stay out of trouble for the rest of the season, which he did. But moments after cleaning out his locker at the end of the season, he headed straight for the bar. Then came 1939. In spring training, Raleigh got hammered one evening on a team train ride, and he ended up causing trouble and setting fires in his teammates' sleeping berths. Manager Witt sent Raleigh back to Cleveland to speak with General Manager Slapnica, and when he got off the train in Cleveland, there were two men there to meet him from Alcoholics Anonymous, which was started just a couple years earlier in nearby Akron. Raleigh was pretty hesitant, but he agreed to give it a shot. When he met with Slapnica, they hashed out a plan where he would fake injuries uh, throughout the season that would allow him to have time off and uh, check into the Akron Hospital for treatment, the same hospital that I was born at, actually. With the help of AA, he was able to stay out of trouble and refocus his life and career. He made the All-Star team in 1939. And then on opening day in 1940, he caught Bob Feller's no-hitter. It was a one and nothing game, and Raleigh even drove in the winning run with an RBI triple. After the game, he revealed his sobriety to the press, and he made the All-Star team again that year. Raleigh really broke protocol by going public. Um, it was supposed to be Alcoholics Anonymous, after all, but at the time, nobody had really heard of AA, and Raleigh claimed to be only their 77th member. AA expanded rapidly as a result of Raleigh's announcement, and his career could have been something really special had he not been an alcoholic for so long, but his contributions to the growth of Alcoholics Anonymous was probably way more important anyway. So all of this kind of hits home for me. I have a pretty personal connection to this story, and I don't want to sound uh, too self-righteous or preachy or anything like that. I don't drink, and I never really drank much to begin with, as drinking just kind of makes me sleepy. But the big reason is that someone that I'm very close to is an alcoholic, and I'm very proud of him for getting the help he needed. As an act of solidarity, the day that he quit drinking, I decided not to drink anymore either. Um, if you know somebody who struggles with addiction, don't give up on them. Encourage them to get help. It is really hard to confront somebody like that. I didn't, and it was almost too late, but he's doing great now, and I couldn't be happier or more proud of him. So there you go, Eddie. Thanks for giving me the impetus to tell this story. I do hope you enjoyed it, and wow, that was a lot of talking for me. Um, you know what, though? While I have you, I'm going to do some more video responses, but I won't make you look at my pretty face anymore. We're just going to look at cards. Sometimes I feel weird about making video responses for channels that I'm not as familiar with, but you know, I think it's good to branch out and make some new friends, right? It's not about the prizes, it's about the connections. 
So RJ collects sets, runs in some of the same circles I do, and I should get to know RJ a little more. He wants to see our best lineup for our favorite team. Easy enough. Most of you know my favorite team is the Guardians slash Indians. I only mention it like all the time. I got a lot to choose from for pitcher, but Bob's a lifer and he's the guy. Catching, we got Santos Alomar Jr. This is my favorite Sandy card, but he's in the wrong uni, so here is a cool Tops kids card. Jimmy's my first baseman. Mr. Napoleon Lajoie is holding down second base for me. At third, we got the Hebrew Hammer, Al Rosen. And Lou Boudreau completes the infield at short. In the outfield, we're going to stick Larry Doby in left. He was a center fielder, but I'm sure he can handle it. Tris Speaker says, look at me. I can be center field. And Rocky's going to play right and hit some monster home runs. Thanks, RJ, for making me dig these cards out again. Always a lot of fun to do a lineup like this. Another guy I need to watch more is Australian legend Dead Centered. Mick wants to see a few things. He wants to hear about our 2022 goals. Uh, I want to keep focused, and I think I'm pretty good at the whole focus thing for the most part. Um, I do want to keep working on my Indians team sets, 50s, 60s, and 70s. I would like to finish the 70s this year. That shouldn't be too tough. Um, I used to have a goal to try to collect autographs from every Indians player, but that's kind of a ridiculous goal, so I streamlined it a bit. Now my goal is to go after all the Indians Hall of Famers, all six Indians World Series team rosters, and I have the opportunity now to collect autographs from every Guardians player. I'm obviously not going to get all of them this year, but uh, that's what's in front of me. Mick also wants to see our top three cards, and I always love pulling these out too. So in no particular order, my autograph destruction crew, just a grail item that I would never thought I'd get my hands on, my T206 Addy Joss portrait. T206s are just these little mythical, magical things. They kind of embody the romanticism of the hobby, to me anyway. And I love Addy, and I love this card. And I always show this one as one of my favorites, the Roy Hobbs custom card that my son made for me. If I was forced to get rid of my whole collection, these are not my most expensive cards, but these are the three that I would keep for sure. So thanks to Eddie's Cardboard Chaos, RJ Collect Sets, and Dead Centered. Go check out those guys, and I'll see you all next week.